In the northern part of the kingdom west, this is where Lion's Gate lies. Here the bird sings outside his nest as he greets the morning sunrise. In Lion's Gate, neath the tall fir trees, on your face feel the ocean breeze. Feel the magic that's in the air, in Lion's Gate the Fair. There's the recording symbol. Recording has now started. Uh, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, welcome to a, a sunny, warm Lion's Den. What a weekend it would have been for an event. Ah, well. <laughs> Uh, before I get started talking here, I just like, like to say that uh, our thoughts are with Mama Sophia right now. Um, anyway, of all the weaving styles, few techniques hold as much challenge, complexity, universality, and opportunity than tapestry. It is an ancient, beautiful, and of all weaving styles, has the fewest limitations on design elements. A good tapestry weaver must create from the ground up, and there is simply no one in this kingdom, or possibly across the SCA, that has achieved the level of mastery in tapestry than a tent. Her level of dedication, consistency, and depth of knowledge is unparalleled. We are profoundly grateful and lucky to have her locally in the barony. For those who have not had the pleasure, her ladyship, the ten, Moira McNessa, has been contributing to Antir for many years now, having first received her award of arms in 1990, same year as me, and one full year before Sir Antonio, which is unheard of. This was followed shortly by her job in 1992, which is our kingdom level award for excellence in the arts and sciences. She also received her Etoile d'Argent in 2018, a similar award recognizing individuals who further our principality through the arts and sciences. She is an active member of the Kingdom Arts and Science team, having presented in Kingdom Arts and Sciences and taught at numerous events. Professionally, she is a textile artist, traveler, and a friend of mine. And so, to paraphrase the Kiwi musician Tim Finn, attend, leave us a rope to pull us through these impossible times. Oh, that was so <laughs> sweet. Thank you. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I am looking forward to this talk. I Questions are always uh, welcome. I've talked to uh, Nergwe, and what we will do is if, if you put them in the chat, um, we will, uh, I will try and answer them between slides. Um, and with that, um, further ado, let's go to my screen share. There we go. There. Okay. So... I'm going to cover quite a, a bit of ground, and I hope I haven't put too much information in, but let's try it and see. So the question of, of uh, tapestry is, what is it? And I'm going to be a bit technical for a while, and then we'll get on to the pretty pictures. So bear with me because I'm assuming that there are people at this, this talk or in the future who watch it who won't know what tapestry is. Um, tapestry is usually image-based and it is tabby woven. And for non-weavers, tab tabby is um, very simple over and under and over and under and over and under. Um, so it's the most basic form of weaving but it's also the most complex form of weaving because um, it's what's called a discontinuous weft. And if you look at this image on your screen, the way it would be woven, you can see the lines across 
that's actually your warp. And so it had been woven from the side and you would, you can't weave under. So you would weave this section and then you might weave this section in this section and then you could go down to this section. So it takes a lot of thinking about what do you weave first and how do you weave it first. The difference between tapestry and brocade is that tapestry, this, the only color you're weaving at this point is this color. A brocade, all of your colors are on the loom and then just the colors you want for the image are pulled up. And if you look at brocades, you can see on the back, you can see all the other threads, all the other colors of thread. So it's a very different process. Um, Killam rugs are also tapestry woven, by the way, and Navajo rugs, same technique. And the other thing about tapestry is it is not needlepoint. This is, this, any, any tapestry weaver, this is one of our bugbears. It is not needlepoint. Needlepoint, I, I, it goes back a long way, but but it was, I believe, was invented to imitate tapestry, but it's much easier to do because you're working on a base. So why did we have tapestry? Well, one of the things is because it's image-based, it's decorative, but it is also can be a teaching tool. And one of the theories is that it was originally in, and I'm talking European tapestry now, um, it was originally used in churches, and you had the, can people see my, me, by the way? The, the choirs along the top of the church, they would have um, bands of tapestry, and it would be um, storytelling. So one of the early pieces that still exists is the story of Abraham and Isaac. And you can see it's, it's like a cartoon. So people who couldn't read could, uh, when attending church, could, could understand the story better. Um, it's also, the theory also was that it was originally wo uh, woven in uh, monasteries and nunneries, and we'll get back to that. Um, so it's decorative but it's also warm. So it would reduce drafts. Um, and that, that's another use in churches, but also in castles and manor houses and that tapestries were used to uh, warm the place up and decorate it. Um, and it's portable. So you would early tapestries in particular were moved when, when um, the nobility moved from, from place to place, they would pack up their tapestries and take them with them. And there's some of the old tapestries, you can still see the holes from the hooks. Um, you can also in some, some buildings, you can see the hooks on the walls where tapestries were originally hung in some castles and things. And later on in particular, it became a status symbol. It became a huge status symbol. And for example, Henry VIII inventory, he had, I'm trying to remember, but I think it was over a thousand tapestries. Um, and uh, the Dukes, Dukes of uh, Burgundy in particular were really big on, on tapestry weaving. And it was, it was interesting because some tapestries like the, the Battle of Roncevaux, um, there was, Tapestry, the winner of that one commissioned tapestries to um, commemorate the winning. But there is also cases of, of um, nobility, dukes and things, carrying their tapestries with them to war and then getting caught, uh, captured and used as spoils of war. So there was a lot of, of um, uses for tapestry. So. And the tapestry you're seeing there is just a little piece picture I took of the VNA. So I'm going to get now into how tapestry was made. And tapestry looms, it's been a really interesting thing to try and figure out because there aren't any existing um, early tapestry looms. Th there are pictures on Greek vases of 
um, some tap some weavers, and in those ones, it looks like it was uh, warp weighted looms. On your left, you have the Osborg ship um, loom that was there. This isn't necessarily a tapestry being woven, and it's a very small loom, but you can see that it could be worked. Finally, I found this illustration in the middle from the Decameron, and that's Penelope being hung because she, Arachne beat her, or he was not happy with her for weaving better than her. And there is an actual tapestry loom there, a small loom. And you can see that the, um, let's see if I can do this, the tapestry bobbins there. So I was really excited to find that one. Now the third picture, is from a book of ours. And I'm really convinced that that's just simply a romantic image of what tapestry weaving might have been because there's no way to tension, there's no way to, it, it just doesn't look real to me. So there are two early images of tapestries being woven by nuns. And what, um, Mercedes Vale says is a fairly good idea of these old looms is obtained from a trademark in the workshop of a German convent of a later date, but accurate enough as the methods of weaving remained almost unaltered during the Middle Ages. In the border of the Passion at Bamberg, two nuns are seen, whoops, what did I just do? Yeah. Two nuns are seen weaving uh, at work. And then you've got this other little nun weaving. And that is, and those were tiny little pieces woven uh, into the border and tucked behind. So it's really cool. Okay. What materials do you use for tapestry? We've covered the loom. Um, most tapestries, especially the original tapestries, were, were used a wool warp. And this was so common that for the longest time, I didn't know what warp they used because um, they never mentioned it because everybody knew it was done on a wool warp. And the early tapestries are all wool. Um, later work uh, added silk and gold and silver silver threads and that's when it became more for the nobility and it became much more of a status symbol and very much later tapestries sometimes used linen or cotton warps and if anybody's ever interested i have a whole huge database of what tapestries and when they were made and and when there is indication of materials what materials they were now what you have in this picture is some of my supplies so you have uh, natural dyed wools that I have. You have some silk threads, you have some gold, you have a pair of scissors, which you would need, and then you have bobbins. These three bobbins are later period bobbins, um, and they can come in all sizes. This is my favorite size. It's about seven inches long, but this one is um, a reproduction of an existing tapestry bobbin. If anybody's followed the Lemberg um, castle finds, there was all sorts of things. People know about the Lemberg bra in particular, but they also found two uh, tapestry bobbins and um, a friend carved that one two size for me. Uh, so that's one of my, my treats. So once you've got your loom and your, your loom warped up, you need a cartoon, and your cartoon is your image. Um, and it's the line drawing used to guide the weaver in creating the image. Uh, it was believed that some of the early weavers drew their own cartoons. It's certainly known that early tapestry weavers had a lot of leeway in how they presented the image, whether they drew the original or not. And they were often given the main images and filled in the background themselves. Now in, 17, in 1476, the Brussels Painters Guild complained that the weavers were using cartoons um, not designed by the painters. So 
proof that before that they were. And the weavers replied that they had always done without the services of painters. An agreement followed. And in my view, this was the first step towards the control of tapestry by painters rather than weavers. So I'm gonna give you a few of the basic um, techniques so that you can, when you're looking at other tapestries, you can understand them, start to understand them. And one of the main distinctions of tapestries is hatching or hachures. And this is the way that, it's, that uh, was developed to show shading. So, and I hope, I usually do this talk on, on uh, projected on a screen, so it's much better. But on this side here in the green, you can see that there's a darker green and a lighter green. And every second thread, the dark green came in and then the light green comes in and the dark green comes in and the light green comes in. And that's called hatching. And what it does is it gives you a third color in between the two. Now on the other side, you've got what's called hachures. And this is a very classic element for tapestry. And instead, this is just one, one, one. And this one you do a long and a slightly shorter and a slightly shorter. So you give it a bigger, uh, uh, it gives, just gives a, a larger image. On the right, and this is a, a small piece. This is an early piece I did actually of a Coptic face. On the right, you will see the beauty of a highly skilled tapestry weaver with hatching and hashers. And if when you start looking at um, especially the draperies and the textiles, it's just amazing what they can do with that technique. Uh, you see velvets that shine, you see uh, metallics that aren't metallic, um, and you also get the wonderful shaping of the draperies. And that's all done. This is two colors, simply two colors. You get the dark in between, but the whole, the whole image is, is done with the two colors. The next technique that you use that you see in tapestries is slits. Now this little piece, again, my warp is going this way. And when you get two colors butting up against each other, you get a slit. You can see the, the slits there. And there's different ways of joining slits. And one of them is, is stitching them up uh, if they're too long. Sometimes little slits are just left in. And because tapestries, because your warp is going horizontal instead of vertical, the weight of the tapestry is not pulling on those slits much and it holds. But again, as tapestry developed as in later ages, they started using slits and those, that kind of area to give you these beautiful shaping. And I just, I mean, the sophistication of this is how they have used it. It's not a classic slit, but they have pulled it tight to give you the shaping and the dimension on the dog. Um, and that's from the unicorn tapestry. Now, the other thing that, that I got the rap, one of the rabbit holes I went down is dovetailing. And dovetailing is another way of joining. And um, I was trying to learn, we'll, we'll come to the British old tapestry, which is a very early piece. And I decided I wanted to learn how it was done. So I tried doing it stitch by stitch and trying to learn dovetailing, which is, is a way of, of joining the slit, taking a long area. And you can see it here and here and here how it was used. I love it on the mouth because it gives you teeth. Um, and it took me a long time to learn how they did dovetailing. Now on the side here, I can't see it on mine because I've got people in front, but on the side here, you can see at the bottom that I tried just one one and that gave me a subtler 
form of joining. Um, okay, so that's your basic techniques. And if anybody wants to learn tapestry, I'm more than happy to teach. Um, so we'll get to the history part. So there's a probable timeline. And it's probable because early history is really vague on it. Um, but we have images and stories of the Greeks weaving tapestries. Um, as I said earlier, there's some pots that show weavers. There's the story of Penelope, of course. There's a story of Arachne. Um, and Odysseus' wife. Uh, there are also examples existing of the Sasanians. Um, I have an image of a little jacket, a boy's jacket that has definitely a tapestry uh, insert on it. But the most examples we have and I'm talking Mediterranean and European, I'm not getting into China, Japan, um, any of those countries. We're just, we're just basically, we're hitting to the Europeans really quick and we're sticking with the Europeans for this talk. Um, but the, the Copts also wove tapestry and um, they were the early Egyptian Christians from the third to the eighth century. And it and I'm this piece you see here right now on the screen. I took that picture in the VNA Museum, and that is about three times its actual size. And the thread used in that is the equivalent of sewing thread, not embroidery thread, sewing thread. It's incredibly fine little piece. That's an early Coptic piece. And the way the Copts often used it, uh, Copts and the Romans for, the, for that matter, is in the tunics. That's where it became very, we probably know it the best. So all of this decorative pieces, that would be probably tapestry woven rather than embroidered in. Um, and they also did some wall hangings and things, but a lot of it was very, very fine pieces used in clothing. Now the theory is, that the uh, weavers probably uh, moved into Byzantium, the Mediterranean weavers, the Copts and that, um, and shared their skills there. I also think that when the Crusaders, um, and that was in 1060, no, 10, in the 1090s to 1099, was the first crusade. And when they came back, I think they brought pieces. And I will show you an example and we will talk more about that in a minute. Um, but I can't prove it, but I think the crusaders brought textiles north and they were copied and studies, studied. And this is why I think that. So this is the St. Jurian tapestry. Uh, on your right hand side, you can see the part of the whole piece. It's a large cloth. It's in uh, the cathedral in Nuremberg. And I originally thought that this was a brocade because it's um, that image, the, the circle with the, um, uh, the griffin attacking a bull. And it's, there's a whole bunch of them in a row, you know, in rows. So I'm thinking, why would you do that? Um, but when I was in the VNA Museum, I got to see this little piece. And the interesting thing about the St. Jerian is because the main piece is in the cathedral at Nuremberg, but there are also small pieces of it in Berlin, Lyon, and London. And this little piece is in the V&A Museum. And when I looked at it closely, it's like, nope, that's tapestry. And it actually, compared to the Coptic piece, it was fairly, um, it was a lot cruder than the Coptic pieces were. Um, and, and although the main body of the piece is stylistically um, Middle Eastern, 
the border is similar to uh, manuscripts, um, European manuscripts. So this is seen very much as, as a transitional piece and was probably woven in Europe, uh, Northern Europe, possibly in, in Nuremberg in Germany, wherever, um, but taking lessons from the pieces, the early pieces. And that's, that's the earliest piece we know for sure. The next piece, and I think a lot of people have seen this piece, is the Baldeschal Tapestry. And it was in the 1800s in a little church in Baldeschal in Norway. People consider it to be a Norse piece. I don't. Um, just because it was found somewhere doesn't mean it was done there. But the technique is, is uh, definitely an early piece. And you get a lot of the hatching, I wish, or the, not the hatching, the, the dovetailing I was showing you. It's the months. This is April. This is May. They figure there was, um, it's part of a piece. There was, they figure there were 12 images originally. The bottom border is very definitely European style, manuscript style design. Um, now, look at the knight on the right. Does that not look like the knights in the Bayou Tapestry? Definitely, I would say a uh, Norman knight. I've gone through my book on the Bayou Tapestry. That particular knight is not in it. Um, so stylistically, it's, it's very similar to the Bayou Tapestry, which is believed to have been done in England um, by Queen Matilda, I believe. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it is the Bayou Tapestry is an embroidery, not a tapestry, but this is a true tapestry. So I, they are saying 1115. I think it might even be earlier. It might have been done in, um, it could have been done in Germany. It could have been done in England, or probably not England. Um, we don't know where it was actually done. But it does, stylistically, it is similar to the pieces in the Halberstadt Cathedral in, in uh, Germany. And these are much better dated. They're from 1180. And if I ever get a chance to go to Germany, I am so going to see these pieces. Um, they're not really well known in any of the tapestry books, which is interesting. But you've got, it's the story of Abraham and the Archangel Michael. And it is, let me just see. No. Um, this is huge. You see the Archangel Michael in a lot of books. You, you don't see the rest of it. And the images, um, it's, I don't know how many feet long. It's, it's, it's narrow, so it was probably done for the church choir, but it is um, the whole story. So it's a, it's a long piece. And... Stylistically, it's similar to illuminated manuscripts from images in Lower Saxony. And it's an early example of storytelling. Uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac and ending with the simple image of the Archangel Michael. And it's using the same joining technique as the Baldashal tapestry, which makes me suspect that they might've been woven a similar place or taught similar or seen other pieces, don't know. Then we get the next earliest piece, and this is the Charlemagne rug. And we're now, um, let me just see, 1180, and this is 1230 to 1249, they figure. Um, the interesting thing about this piece is it is on a wall now, but it is tufted. It is considered to be a rug. 
And it's a totally different technique than is normally used. Just an interesting anomaly that we've only got that piece left. Um, brings to mind issues of overlap between um, tapestry and rug weaving. And some of the later Franconian tapestries uh, have sections of tufting included. And I have not seen this used in other, other places, but the Franconian tapestries. And now, so that's up to about 1250. And now we, things jump. Look at that. This is part of the apocalypse of Angers. Um, and it is mind boggling. So the story about it is that in 1375, Jean de Bondolf, called Hennequin of Bruges, receives a commission from the Duc d'Anjou for the hanging, the apocalypse. Nicolas Bataille, a Parisian high warp weaver, was asked to undertake the weaving. Now he wouldn't have done it all on his own. He would have been, it would have been a workshop. Uh, other people would have woven it as well. And today it hangs in the, in the chateau at Angers. This tapestry is huge. Uh, one section measures over eight feet uh, long, wide by um, five feet deep. And the whole is composed of seven hangings, 80 feet long and 20 feet high. And some of it's been lost. And you can see it's been chopped up. You can see parts where there's, there's borders and borders missing and, and all sorts of damage has been done. Some of the, some, I don't think it's a case of Ange, but um, I know some of the unicorn tapestries were found um, covering people's cabbages. Uh, there was a period where tapestries were not respected at all. And um, so you can see there's been just like this huge, huge development in tapestry weaving and, and undoubtedly looms. Um, and it's now commercial and secular and not used. That wouldn't have been used in a church. And there's a detail of it. Um, supposedly they borrowed, um, who was it, Charles? Which Charles? Uh, the Duc d'Anjou um, borrowed a manuscript from the King of France, his brother. And that's what they used. Um, for the story of the apocalypse. And then they put out the images for the whole thing. It's, it's, I am, it's amazing. So tapestry has just jumped huge. In 18, in 1385, you get the nine heroes tapestries. And this was a large tapestry, uh, which includes Jean de Berry's uh, arms. So it's attributed to him. Uh, and he was a huge patron of tapestry weavers and other artists. Um, there's an illustration in the uh, Trey Richeurs of, of uh, Jean de Berry, and it's a room he's having a banquet. And in the room, you can see the wall behind is this huge tapestry. And in fact, they've sort of rolled it up and tucked it behind the fireplace, and then it goes around. And, and often tapestries weren't woven for a sp particular space. So they would either cut them up to fit, or they would roll it up when they wanted to do something like that. Um, and the piece on the right, or the left, is actually a detail from there that I wove of Arthur's face. And I just, he's got such a great face. Um, so, sidelight. Now I'm gonna show you some pictures while I give you a brief history. So, um, the, the um, official workshops were established in Paris, Arras, Trenai, and Brussels. 
In 1398, the Ternai Weaver's rules were established. So there's documentation of the, of the rules. Um, actually, we'll go back. In 1415, the French were defeated at Agincourt. Um, the Hundred Years' War was really impressed in, important in tapestry because of the war between the English and the French, which was the Hundred Years' War. It caused all sorts of disruptions in tapestry weaving and weavers, because looms were fairly portable, not small, but, but you could break them down and take them, weavers moved back and forth. Um, so the defeated Agincourt um, messed up the Paris workshops. And in 1418, the Paris weavers were dispersed and the Hundred Years' War, had, okay, Fortunately, yeah, I've covered that. Um, and so the, the weavers moved to where there were other patrons. In some cases, it makes it very hard to stylistically tell where pieces were woven and unless there were actual records of who commissioned the piece and who wove it. And in, in some cases, there's lots of good documentation, documentation. In some cases, there's none. The pieces you're seeing on, on the screen right now are from the Upper Rhinish or the Franconian. Uh, I was taught to call them Swiss German pieces. And they're stylistically very different from the French weavers, the French and, and Flemish weavers. And 1449, Philip Le Bon, Duke of Burgundy, commissioned the Gideon series for the Order of the Golden Fleece. And if you've ever seen the pieces for the Order of the Golden Fleece, they're spectacular. And in 1452, the statutes of the Brussels weavers were written at the end of the second, uh, the end of the Hundred Years' War. Ah, that's another nice one. So what kind of thing images got used later in tapestry? And you got a lot of um, courtly images, images of day-to-day -day life. Um, because they were used for a status symbol. Um, you got nymphs and ladies frolicking. You got um, rich people dressed up as peasants. You got all sorts of things and a lot of images of courtly love. Um, this is now heading into the high Gothic style and there was less emphasis on religious imagery and more in the secular, though you still got um, religious imagery. These included scenes of noble couples, hunting scenes, peasants or nobles dressed as peasants, battles, mythological scenes and allegories. And they can get really, really complex allegories. Um, this is the Devonshire hunting tapestries. It's, I think, six pieces. It's five or six pieces. They are huge. The images of the people in them are larger than life size. Um, they're in the v &A Museum, and if you're ever there, go see them. They are so, so beautifully done. And the colors are amazing still. Um, there's one area, I think it's here in her, her dress, the purple just shimmers. Um, so, the next we get, next stylistically we get into, is Milfleur. And the theory is that in 1066, Philip Le Bon commissions eight works with a background of small flowers carrying the Duke's coat of arms. And this was supposedly one of the early Milfleur tapestries. These flowers and beasts were very realistic. And as a result, you can identify many of the plants common to the time. It's amazing. There's some pieces that they've actually um, identified like 50 different, different plants. And it's a way that botanists have, have dis made some decisions about what was, was growing them. Um, there is some belief that this particular style was, was woven in the Loire Valley. And there's a detail of, of a little piece of the of Milfleur tapestry. You can see how incredibly detailed it is. I took that at the v &A Museum.
So in the next hundred years, tapestry changes. It gets much larger, more professional, and is commissioned by nobles and royalty. You can see the sophistication of the imagery and the incredible complexity. However, there is no horizon line or sense of modeling or any real sense of perspective. Often various vin vignettes of the image are all sort of put together in it. So you can follow it through, you, you know, something's happening here and another thing's happening here and another thing's happening here. Um, and that this one is the war with Troy, um, which was in um, late 1400s. You do still get religious tapestries. This one we've you've heard of Pas uh, Pascal Grenier before. He was a Trinidad master weaver possibly more of, of a middleman than an actual weaver that he ran a workshop. Because you can imagine if you're weaving some of these huge sets, you know, it wouldn't have been just one person working on it. It would be a group of people working on it. And the materials needed for it to come, you know, to finance the materials for it and the time, because these pieces sometimes took up to five years to weave. Um, so there were, uh, Pascal Grenier is one of the names that comes up a lot as, as a uh, owner or a master weaver. And this one was presented to the, the, uh, the town, the Church of St. Quentin. And now we come to the one we all probably know, which is, you know, again, 1480s. Um, there's two sets of the unicorn tapestries. And the belief was that the unicorn, um, it come, partly comes from a medieval poem, but it was seen that the unicorn was Christ. And the search for the unicorn was the search for Christ. Now, why they had to kill it, as you see, um, that's a whole other thing that I'm not gonna go into right now, or ever, actually. So the unicorn tapestries are in the cloister, or in the Cloisters Museum, the Metro at uh, in New York. Um, this is the Hunt of the Unicorn, which is another series, and it's very detailed as well. And it goes goes through a series. There's also a unicorn set that it's the Lady and the Unicorn, and it's the uh, considered to be the Five Senses. So there was a number of unicorn pieces. And that's something to know about, about uh, tapestries is that you have the cartoon, you have a master weaver, but Henry VIII of England might say, I want a unicorn set. And uh, the Duke uh, Philip the Bon might say, I want a unicorn set and somebody in Spain or the, or the Pope might want a set. And they could be different, slightly different sizes. They would certainly be slightly different in, in color and how they were done. Um, but it wasn't necessarily just one. And this is this can lead to some confusion as well. And then of course they got burned up, they got destroyed in war, they got um, some of them were actually um, melted down for the, the metallic thread, the gold and the silver thread in them. Uh, when, when tapestry wasn't respected. So there isn't a lot of existing tapestry left. It wasn't until the late 1800s and actually some of the um, American collectors like the Rothschilds, that tapestry became a value again. And as I said, some were found covering cabbages. Um, just a little side note. Another use of uh, another stylistic thing of tapestry is the arm, armorial. And there's um, descriptions of whole rooms that were, you got, you ordered sets of tapestries, you got your wall hanging, you got your bed covering, you got your uh, bed curtains, you got pillows. 
Um, so you might, and quite often, at least part of those would be your arms, so that you know you wanted to show off who you were. This one happens to be the badge of John Lord of Denham, and I have no idea who he was. Okay, we're getting later in tapestry, and I've talked about how designs could be rewoven. And um, sometimes, quite often, in fact, you would say, I want the central image to be this size, and I want a border of, in this case, uh, looks like uh, leaves and somebody's arms in the corners. Um, and note in this one, you are not getting, we are not getting, um, it's a single image. You're not getting the, the groups, the, more the stories in one piece. Um, so this is the later piece. And it's when, in my view, tapestry is starting to change. It's starting to be looked at in a different way. Um, and we'll come back to that. I'm going to take now a side trip to one of the things I love, which is Franconian or the Swiss German tapestries. And they were stylistically very different. And the cool thing about them is that they were less for the nobility and more for the merchant class. And so you get smaller pieces, you get devotional pieces. This uh, little piece here, again, this is a picture I took in the VNA. It's only a partial piece. It was about 10 inches high. And the flowers in it and that, the weaving in it is just so beautiful. And um, the Virgin Mary, her face was um, blank and her uh, uh, features were, wo uh, were embroidered on and they've worn off. They're not there anymore. You can just barely see them. Um, the other, another way you can tell of the the Swiss German tapestries is they often had these banners that told you what was happening. Um, I, I can't remember what my teacher used to call them, the something Spreck banners, and they were, they were talking about what was going on. And this is what the other thing I absolutely love about the, their, their tapestries because you got the Wildman tapestries. And the German speaking world in the late 14th and 15th centuries, the role of the wild people or fabulous beasts was the most favored theme in art, poetry and pageant, besides romantic subjects and religion. Although of course this was not confirmed to the German speaking lands, but the wild men and beasts accordingly imply freedom, energy and natural instincts. And they have all these silly furry people with these wonderful beasts. They're just so much fun. Um, this is another late German piece, and it's the story of the buzzard. And it's um, a tale of a German princess and a French prince who fall in love and they're not supposed to. And there's a whole thing. He gets turned into a hawk and she has the hawk. And it's a long and a complicated story. But it's significant. One of the significances of it is that this piece is um, can be related to a particular lit literary source, and other fragments of the same story are in different European collections, and it depicts a much greater proportion of this. And this particular one, which is in the V&A, um, depicts a much greater proportion of the story than any other of the pieces in other museums. I got to see this piece. I was really lucky um, because it's not out. And one of the things that I realize as I'm looking at it is this is the prince in an early, trying to figure out where he is. I think he's right there. Um, but this section of him was tufted. You can see where it's gone. You can see the warp showing up there. But this is. Uh, a pile piece in it. 
And that was the first time I, the only time, in fact, I have ever seen, actually seen it in a tapestry. Okay, we are coming to the end because at the beginning of the 16th century, tapestry changes forever in my view. Um, it's starting to be the Renaissance. Perspective and modeling are introduced with relevant horizon line and objects receding into the distance, creating the impression of realism. This is when tapestry started to trying to copy painting, leading to the realization of why pay for a tapestry, which is time consuming and expensive, when you could have a painting. Uh, the tapestry carried on, but it became more and more complex and finer ends per inch and up to about 24 ends per inch, which becomes um, more like a brocade as far as I do. This is the Raphael cartoon. And the Pope at the time um, commissioned Raphael to design a series and he did they're painted they're painted on I believe it's paper and you can actually see how it was put together to make a huge piece because they're giant um, and he painted them of uh, the story of of Jesus and they were they were designed and woven for the Sistine Chapel and they're still I believe in the Sistine Chapel the v &A owns the cartoons. And I also believe that it was woven more than once from, from the Raphael cartoons. But when you look at later tapestries, um, it's just sort of fancy paintings. Whereas when you look at the early ones, they're much, much more interesting than that. So that is the end of my talk. I see there's some things in the chat. Uh, is there any, hmm, I can't tell. Is there Again, any question? I can't, I'm gonna... I can't believe you covered a thousand years of tapestry in just <laughs> under an hour. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, there's so much more I could have put in, but, but, uh, I hope, I hope it was, was, uh, interesting. Oh, I can stop share now. Um, I had a question, yep. especially about the early stuff. So um, I've been doing a little bit of uh, Coast Salish weaving unrelated to this talk. Um, and they, when they warp on, they use the third bar. Is there any evidence for, for third bar anywhere else in the world in, in period? Later. Later. Later, okay. much later. And um, you see the huge looms, which are still actually used um, very similar looms used today in, in um, Arras, in, in France. Um, and I'm trying to remember the other one. There's, there was, there's a school still in France a little bit. It's become more of, of a, more like a heritage site than an actual um, workshop. But the fascinating thing for me was when I was in Senegal, a friend mentioned the town that did tapestry weaving. And I was there and they have very similar looms and they're taking um, local Senegalese painters and turning their pieces into tapestry. And the um, man who started it studied in, in Arras in France. Hmm. Um, so the, the, looms, the looms really haven't changed that much and they do have um, a way of of bringing up the warp, that that the third bar that that separates your warp for you. Mm. But the Salish is often is it tabby or is it twined? Both, both. Okay, it's both. Yeah, it's more traditionally twined. Um, yeah. But I uh, mo modernly, it's obviously still a very active art form. Um, I, I certainly see a lot. I see I see both being used. Right. Um, yeah. When I 
I've taken a couple of classes um, and then usually in classes, it's just twined when they teach it. Yeah. So you see both. Whereas Navajo is, is uh, usually tap is tabby. Mm. And, and um, then, yeah. what's your, what's your favorite period? I really, one favorite? Um, I really like, well, I'm, if anybody, for the people who don't know me well, uh, I've got a show coming up at the um, Craft Council shop and gallery on Granville Island in late August. It'll be there all September. But I've been focusing on faces. And what started me on it was the Coptic faces. And that piece I showed you just now, or you know, earlier when we were talking about what we were doing, is a little Coptic face. And I find I like the earlier pieces better than the later pieces. They get so complicated and so allegorical. I mean, every little thing has meaning. You know, it's not a lady lying there. It's temperance being stomped on by who knows what, you know, <laughs> they're really. And you had to, people knew it. People understood the stories. There, there was a whole language that you were trained. If now we're talking nobility only, of course. Um, but you were, you were trained to understand the meanings of the allegories, um, and that, did that answer your question? Yes, very much so. I love, I like that you tied in your, your favorite with, with the techniques that you can sort of explore and celebrate. I think that was, that's, that's a nice way to tie it in. Learning dovetailing was was a whole thing for me because I thought I knew it and then I tried doing it literally taking a picture blowing it up and doing it stitch for stitch thinking that I could you know I can figure it out nope it's much more complex than that I finally found a Swedish book that showed me um the actual class in biblical yes yes you're right Kushak yeah it's, and it comes up in art history, teaching you the meaning of all of, and paintings too, paintings and, and tapestry. It. It's, all, it's all there. There are so many classical and biblical references yep. that everybody in period knew, or at yep. least that people who were in Western Europe knew, you know, if, if you happen to be running that, that persona, yep. maybe, maybe not um, known in the new world. But uh, yeah, uh, you, you, if you if you showed um, who was it um, patron saint of of uh, cooks Saint Lawrence, you knew it was Saint Lawrence because he was shown with a gridiron. Yep, which is a symbol of his martyrdom. Well, the American uh, barbecue artists are now he's their patron saint too, you know, because he was grilled. Yeah. So, you know, it, it all the, those references are still there, but people don't necessarily know why. Now it's a pretty picture. Or it's a cool thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Other people, what did you think? Comments, queries, things I left, should have left out, things I should have put in. <laughs> nope. I'm sure there was a lot more you could have put in. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jen. Have you yeah. seen any, one of the things I really like about the Salish looms here on the coast is that they have a built-in yarn holder at the bottom for all their yarn balls as they, is that, is that a thing? Like I, I was looking for something similar um, in the examples you gave of, of, of people, of women weaving, but I didn't see any. Is that something that just happens here? If, no, because, well, if you, see if I can find it again. Let's go screen share, because this is really kind of cool. Um, okay, and bear with me, I'm getting better at this. See down there? Mm -hmm. I, I did see that. Yes, the basket. Yep. Yeah, the basket of wool. And actually, I find I do that. I have a series of flat 
pockets that all my wolves go in. Okay. Um, and, and again, I think that here po possibly would be a tensioning device for the loom, maybe, <laughs> is, is one of my theories. Because if you look at, at this, you can't see how it's done. Now, interesting, she's both of these, she's weaving from the top. Mm -hmm. Here she's weaving from the bottom and beating down. Um, I certainly, yeah, I certainly beat from the bottom and, and, and uh, beat down instead of uh, beating up. But the Osberg ship loom has your, your, that third bar. Is that, isn't that a heddle rod? Yeah. Or, oh, okay. So, oh, okay. I think the third bar you're talking about makes for a longer piece that you can is that what you're... yeah that's, sorry a third tensioning bar that's what i meant sorry right yeah yeah no i i don't i've never seen that i, on, I didn't on think those. so okay no it's the heddle rod okay and that yeah yeah and you can i love this middle image though isn't that wonderful it's, when it's, I found... it's a pretty sexy yes. stuff yeah when i saw that i was literally jumping for joy because it's Finding images, except for the two little nuns, finding images, there just, there aren't any. There's lots of pictures of later, uh, the French workshops and that. There's some etchings, etchings, yeah, I think ex etchings um, of them. And they're huge, you know, these giant looms and, and the whole thing. But to see the smaller ones was, was really exciting for me. And of course the reference to Arachne you know, you know, we get that in the, in the Kingdom Lace Guild, or Arachne's Web. Yep. With yep. that reference to... Uh, yep. yep, the earliest weaver of all. And, and, and of course, the uh, reminder not to, to go and, and do nasty things about the gods. Oh, you don't mess with them. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> I found no. it fascinating looking at the bobbins, because, of course, having done lace, or bobbin lace, um, the similarity and yet the difference. Very different. And one of the main differences is size. The pointed end. Yeah. Well, and also size, because my tapestry bobbins are about three inches. Or my uh, lace bobbins? Lace bobbins are about three inches, and my tapestry bobbins are about seven. Yeah, mine are four to five. Yeah. Like this is this is the carved one. This is a different one. And the ones. I love are this size. Yeah. But of course you need the pointed end in order to go through to beat down. And to be but also to to pick your way through the through the uh the works. No, no, you use oh. your fingers. Right. You yeah. Use your, wow. you use your fingers. And that's why you have the smooth end, because you slip it through and then you beat it down. Oh, I think mine are a little bit bigger than, than your yeah, mo most are bigger. I, I actually was lucky. I was working at a senior or not working. I was going to a senior center in North Van and they had a men's workshop. Well, it wasn't just men, but supposedly, but it was men. In the basement. Yep. The men in the basement. I got them. They had a little tiny, probably, um, a lathe for for pens and things but i got him making uh, little bobbins for me so i i was really lucky because originally you know people usually have one or two bobbins and i've got about 24 and it's not enough <laughs> i know when when uh, we did the many many years ago when we did the needle um needle threaders workshop with roberto of rowan on bobbin lace Mm -hmm. a six week um, session and she had got some bobbins from the Vancouver Lace Guild and I know Curtis was able to duplicate them on his lathe for me and for some of the other ladies too so a lot of us rather than having a couple of dozen we were able to have you know four or five six dozen which meant yep. you had to wider lace yeah yeah yeah, because because when I'm weaving each area, uh, it can be the same color, but it can be an area here and an area here and an area here, and so I need a bobbin for 
each of those time. areas. Yeah, it can, it can get really complex. But that's the fun of it. It keeps your brain working all the time. And that, so what do they use Kiva for Salish? Do they use bobbins or do they no. just? So you don't get the, you, I mean, I can't speak for all, yeah. all, all Salish communities and I, and I, I wouldn't want to. Um, you you usually have about sort of six to eight colors. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually hand spun on a wheel. And right. then, so for anyone who doesn't know, I, I actually live on the, I'm not Musqueam, I live on the Musqueam Reserve and I do um, some weeping and dying here with, with some of the people here. So they'll have large skein, they'll have large balls um, of color and then they usually sit and then, um, and then it's all done by hand. Like you don't cut any of the strands. You usually pull the strand apart because the weft is single ply and the warp is double ply. So it's usually double plied white, but not all weavers do that. Some of them do colors. And then the weft is single ply that's pulled apart and then it's woven in with a, with a crochet hook. Oh, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, huh. yeah, and so it's very geometric solid colors obviously the, the sort of classic colors would be black red and yellow but you get depending on depending on the piece and the, and the purpose of it that it can change yeah one one of the um things i didn't mention about the earlier pieces is that that most of them were between uh 10 and, and 20 colors only and when um Hen not henry moore uh, uh, arts and crafts guy, Kelmscott. Everybody knows who I mean, and that's and I've just blanked on his name. William Morris. Well, William Morris. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nergway. <laughs> when William Morris was was um, bringing back. Um, medieval tapestry weaving. That's one of his big things is the later ones use too many colors. And, and it's true. I, I knew a woman who wove the some some pieces of uh, for Henry Moore. Um, they did some of his drawings. And she said they had over a thousand shades of gray to work with, which gets a bit crazy. And you I could. definitely have to be working in good light in order to differentiate which ones. Always, always. I, I can't weave any more at night because yeah. I just, I'm working with, with color all the time. Are you still doing, and I know for a period you were doing your own natural dyes and, and dyeing. Is that something you do? Like, where do you get your materials from? I know because I'm selling my pieces and I'm not a good enough dyer. I thought I was pretty hot stuff when I left school. And then I discovered that I'm really not. <laughs> I, had a, I had a really good taster course. Um, I have a piece on my wall that, that is never in the sun, but, but uh, I've watched it change color. And so I now use commercial wools only. I use Appleton uh, tapas, uh, cruel wool. And it's very fine. And I oft, usually weave with three strands and very often I mix. So I'm not using one color. Mm. I'm using very often three colors on a piece. Mm. Um, and that gives, and that is, it was, it's called blending on the bobbin. It was used uh, in later medieval times. Uh, the early pieces were, were it was not used, um, but it gives me the results I want. Uh, and for people who don't know, um, I have now a Facebook page, uh, Tapestry, Trish Graham Tapestry, um, that I'm starting to put up um, pieces I'm working on, talking a bit about what I'm doing in that. So feel free to, to check it out. Um, and you can, then you can get some of the better images. But I find that, that I like to have more and more and more as I work, I like to be be more and more subtle in my color uses. Mm. And that, could I recognize the Al Scale uh, silk pearl in your materials? Silk pearl. The silk 
pearl cotton you're showing your 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 equipment oh, oh yeah i actually i don't use it I, but I, I wanted to show some silk yeah oh. <laughs> yeah um you can get that at the silk tree yeah where you yeah, so silk weaving studio in Granville, yes. Uh, but it's also very nice for embroidery. It is, but you know what I use mostly for my embroidery, the silk embroidery, is I know weavers who give me their, it's called the thrums, it's the end of the, the loom. Yes, they sell and, them at, at uh, the painted yeah. ones at, at uh, Silk Tree as well. Yeah, yeah, and um it's fun in my embroideries because I like the fact that they're often not one color. There's a no. shift, you know, a subtle shifts in color in that. So it makes it makes it fun. I know the the lady who used to own the silk tree and is now does their principal dyeing lives out here in Maple Ridge, and um, you know the part the the project I'm working on right now for Mr. Seglinda, she had had some war pens that she got at silk at uh, silk tree. And when I went back, they weren't selling that way, the, the kind of silk that they were doing. They weren't selling silk ends in those anymore. So yeah. I had to get, order it and get it basically dyed to order. Uh, wow. Uh, well, it's not not the way, it didn't have as much color uh, variation as, as the originals did. Yeah. But um, it, it gives a, a really interesting you know variation when you when you do have them i, I like using variegated of yeah. that sort in in embroidery um yeah. just for effect you know like a solid area of of that and then have the rest tone in yeah, yeah. um but yeah so gorgeous stuff but if you, the thing is if you're going to use it for embroidery get all you need at the time because you're never going to find it again nope oh. oh. So then you just make something else up to make it work. I haven't done any huge embroidery projects that, that that's been the case with. I thought the ones I've done so far have been smallish. Yeah. But that's that's why when I do the blending on the bobbin, it gives me that subtlety and, and the control. And I'm very, very lucky for people who want to, you know, are wondering about technique and that. Um, the... Um, Button and Needlework Boutique in on uh, in Trans Alley in Victoria um, carries all of the Appleton wools, and I was intelligent enough before all of this happened that I actually got a sample set, um, and he's been fabulous with ordering. I just let him know what I need, and he ships it to me. Um, We've become, Mike and I are now good friends. <laughs> I, I, I had a question for you, Atan. Yeah. I mean, you've taken something that you're very passionate about in the SCA um, and, and, and grown it into a very significant part of your life. I was wondering if you had any advice for people who maybe are passionate about something in the SCA and are wondering, is, could this be a career? Is this, is this, is it, what, what are some things that you've learned uh, from that aspect that you that you feel you could pass on maybe? Oh boy. I can see that working for weaving. I can see it working for nail binding or, or later period knitting. Um, embroidery, people don't use it anymore. Um, so it works within the SCA and it can actually become an income source for people with, but only within recreationist groups. And it's sad that we don't, I mean, when I was, when I was a hippie in my youth, I used to embroider my clothes, um, and, and don't anymore. I know I had hoped when I came back to Canada, I thought I'd, loved Lord of the Rings and the banners and, and the clothing and Lord of the Rings. And I thought I'm going to go back to Victoria and take textile arts at cap. And then I will get into the movie industry and I will sit for hours embroidering, you know, um, and then my teacher who also works in the movie industry explained the kind of hours that are expected in that. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, do, but, you, do, you, 
do you have any advice? Like what, what's, what's been, what's open, what are some things you've done that have opened the most doors or what's, what's like maybe one thing you could. Being passionate. Really, I would do what I'm doing. It helped that I have a show coming up because it gave me a focus and thank God through this period of, of uh, quarantine and that if I didn't have it, I would probably be sitting watching TV all day, um, but now I get up and it's my job. I weave at least three to four hours a day, but I probably would have done most of that anyway. And what mm. I found is um, like a friend really liked one of my pieces and insisted on paying for it. And then a couple of other people have, have bought pieces and but it was because I was doing it and because I was passionate about it anyway mm -hmm. um, is, is the only thing I can suggest. But I'm, you know, I'm also very, very fortunate because of my age. I'm technically retired, so I don't have to make a living. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, because if I was younger, I, well, I always said I would learn to weave when I got old. <laughs> <laughs> And the first weaving class I took at CAP at the age of 62, I went, right. I always said I would learn to weave when I get old. <laughs> you, you are a graduate of the CAP program then? Like I, am, I was in the last, last, the last batch, batch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you actually get to finish? Because I, I realized mm -hmm. the last batch did not. No, we did. Uh, there was the option of a third. No, they didn't. Uh, it was at the end of my first year that the, the, the course was closing and wow. they, and they um, kept us, they didn't do another intake, but wow. this, the first year got to do their second year. Now I had planned on going for the third, the, the course was a diploma course for two years yeah. with an option of a third year. And there were a number of people who were doing it in bits and pieces. Um, Jay, um, forgot her last name but people know her as a, a lace weaver she used to be in the SCA um, she had planned on on continuing for for the uh, degree course by taking the third year and she was doing some of it but didn't get to finish yeah um, so people who were doing it in parts didn't but because my group we were taking it um, s solidly and, I'm glad to the, hear that they let the people who when oh, they, 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 they would have been in huge trouble if they'd canceled it, but it did mess up like I would have gone on for the degree. Um, the third year was directed studies and uh, I would have done that. Yep. Jay Rudolph. Mm. And I forget her SCA name, uh, but she played for a long time here in Lionsgate. I think Mara went through a couple of years ahead of you. Yeah. I went through even before Mara and uh, right. Dan did. So I, I went through in, I started in the program in 1999. So it was, it was a completely different program at the time. Totally different. Yeah. Was, was CAP still, was CAP, CAP college then? Yeah. Yeah. And parking was still free. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so I actually I, did the tapestry component of it then, but it's been long enough that I actually had to reach out and ask for help because I forgot a bunch of stuff. <laughs> oh, it's easy to forget. Also, it was just a taster. I mean, a lot of what I've learned, I've had to teach myself. And one of the things about books on tapestry, and I have most of the main books on tapestry is they show you pretty pictures and they talk about the images. So there's, there's modern books that are ta teaching tapestry techniques, but um, the historical books don't teach you technique. Mm. And that. For anybody who's interested, would you mind um, 
giving us a, a list of a couple of those modern books? Sure, just say. The two best I've found are, okay, make me come up. How do I come up? You're, you're there. Okay. Um, so this is uh, Nancy Harvey's uh, Comprehensive Guide, and it covers the basics. My favorite is uh, Kirsten Glassbrook's book. And if you do her, she's got a couple of samplers in it. And if you do those, you will learn all the basic techniques. And these ten, are- ten, How do you spell that last name? I'm just, I'm just writing it in the chat for anybody who wants it. Right. Uh, Kirsten Glass, G-L-A-S Brook, B-R-O-O-K. Okay. Search Press. And neither, neither of those books are expensive. They're modern. Most of the people now in tapestry groups I've been part of are learning online. There's a number, it's, it's like if you're a weaver, um, Joan Stafford in Salt Spring is, everybody's taking Joan's classes. And there's, I think Kirsten's is teaching. And there's someone else that a lot of people are taking online classes with. Cool. And if, you got, if you're interested in tapestry, there's some fabulous stuff happening with modern tapestry. Uh, Sarah Sweat is doing some just amazingly beautiful stuff um, and innovative uh, pieces with tapestry. It's, it's, it's fun to, to do uh, a Google search and see what's, what's being done. Or Archie Brennan is, um, Archie just died in the last year but he was one of the um, early weavers with the Dovecot studio in, in uh, Edinburgh. Okay, uh, in Edinburgh. And they're doing a retrospective show of his stuff. And he's, he's just beautiful, beautiful stuff. And, and really um, almost art deco, really clear, crisp, complex things. So that's another thing if you're at all interested in tapestry, do see what's happening today too. Um, I, added, I added a, name, a couple names. Uh, if, you, if you're a weaver interested in Coast Salish weaving, Janice and Buddy George, who are Squamish nation, um, will, will have an open policy. Anybody from any cultural background is allowed to come in and take their classes. Nice. So they, yeah, it's cool. So they'll do sort of one or two day workshops like the Museum of Vancouver. And so they um, there's, they're definitely worth, and they, they'll do like interesting little, little pieces, like, so you get to actually finish a little piece. The, when the, uh, Textile Society of America had their conference here a couple of years ago, I got to know of them through that a little bit, and, and they're lovely people, just really, yeah. really yeah, lovely nice. open people, yeah. Um, um, what was that you were saying? Are you, Etan, are you, are you thinking about doing the, the fiber, the mushroom fiber symposium for 2022? Um, I didn't, uh, possibly. I hadn't paid any attention to, I'm really bad at following up on things like that. <laughs> um, the Lincoln. Yeah. Because I know what you're doing with mushrooms is just fascinating. <laughs> that that bat, last batch of colors you got was was spectacular. Oh, thank you. I, I, I don't want to jack your talk, though. I'll talk oh, about that's fine. I think my, talk, time. my um, talk is sort of over. Jack it. Go, go ahead. Jack my oh, talk. Okay, okay. So that's the other thing I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to actually, when, if, you're, if you're ready, we can wrap up the talk, turn off the recording, and then just keep going oh. as a more social. I think it's been turned off already. No, it's no, still it's still recording. recording I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Good because nobody has, you know, sworn to use poor language or anything. So, right. Turn off the, the turn off the recording. My little record on uh -huh. button is gone. <laughs>